Little Women by Louisa May Alcott Chapter 19 Amy Swill While these things were happening at home, Amy was having hard times at Aunt Marge's. She felt her exile deeply and, for the first time in her life, realized how much she was beloved and petted at home. Aunt Marge never petted anyone. She did not approve of it. But she meant to be kind, for the well-behaved little girl pleased her very much, and Aunt March had a soft place in her old heart for her nephew's children, though she didn't think proper to confess it. She really did her best to make Amy happy, but, dear me, what mistakes she made! Some old people keep young at heart in spite of wrinkles and gray hairs, can sympathize with children's little cares and joys, make them feel at home, and can hide wise lessons under pleasant plays, giving and receiving friendship in the sweetest way. But Aunt March had not this gift, and she worried Amy very much with her rules and orders, her prim ways, and long, prosy talks. Finding the child more docile and amiable than her sister, the old lady felt it her duty to try and counteract as far as possible the bad effects of her home freedom and indulgence. So she took Amy in hand and taught her as she herself had been taught sixty years ago, a process which carried dismay to Amy's soul and made her feel like a fly in the web of a very strict spider. She had to wash the cups every morning and polish up the old-fashioned spoons, the fat silver teapot, and the glasses till they shone. Then she must dust the room, and what a trying job that was! Not a speck escaped Aunt March's eye, and all the furniture had claw legs, and much carving which was never dusted to suit. Then Polly must be fed, the lap dog combed, and a dozen trips upstairs and down to get things or deliver orders, for the old lady was very lame and seldom left her big chair. After these tiresome labors, she must do her lessons, which was a daily trial of every virtue she possessed. Then she was allowed one hour for exercise or play, and didn't she enjoy it? Laurie came every day and wheedled Aunt Marge till Amy was allowed to go out with them, when they walked and rode and had capital times. After dinner, she had to read aloud and sit still while the old lady slept which she usually did for an hour as she dropped off over the first page. Then patchwork or towels appeared, and Amy sued with outward meekness and inward rebellion till dusk, when she was allowed to amuse herself as she liked till tea time. The evenings were the worst of all, for Aunt Marge fell to telling long stories about her youth, which were so unutterably dull that Amy was always ready to go to bed, intending to cry over her hard fate, but usually going to sleep before she had sweet squeezed out more than a tear or two. If it had not been for Laurie and old Esther the maid, she felt that she never could have got through that dreadful time. The parrot alone was enough to drive her distracted, for he soon felt that she did not admire him, and revenged himself by being as mischievous as possible. He pulled her hair whenever she came near him, upset his bread and milk to plague her when she had newly cleaned his cage, made Mob bark by pecking at him while Madame dozed, called her names before company, and behaved in all respects like a reprehensible old bird. Then she could not endure the dog, a fat cross beast who snarled and yelped at her when she made his toilet, and who lay on his back with all his legs in the air, and the most idiotic expression of countenance when he wanted something to eat, which was about a dozen times a day. The cook was bad-tempered, the old coachman deaf, and Esther the only one who ever took any notice of the young lady. Esther was a French woman who had lived with Madame, as she called her mistress, for many years and who rather tyrannized over the old lady, who could not get along without her. Her real name was Estelle, but Aunt Marge ordered her to change it, and she obeyed, on condition that she was never asked to change her religion. She took a fancy to Mademoiselle, and amused her very much, without stories of her life in France, 
when Amy sat with her while she got up Madame's laces. She also allowed her to roam about the great house and examine the curious and pretty things stored away in the big wardrobes and the ancient chest, for Aunt Marge hoarded like a magpie. Amy's chief delight was an Indian cabinet full of queer drawers, little pigeonholes, and secret places in which were kept all sorts of ornaments, some precious, some merely curious, all more or less antique. To examine and arrange these things gave Amy great satisfaction, especially the jewel cases in which on velvet cushions reposed the ornaments which had adorned a bell forty years ago. There was the garnet set which Aunt March wore when she came out, the pearls her father gave her on her wedding day, her lover's diamonds, the jet mourning rings and pins, the queer lockets with portraits of dead friends and weeping willows made of hair inside, the baby bracelets her one little daughter had worn, Uncle March's big watch with the re red seal so many childish hands had played with, and in a box, all by itself, lay Aunt March's wedding ring, too small now for her fat finger, but put carefully away like the most precious jewel of them all. Which would Mademoiselle choose if she had her will? asked asked her, who always sat near to watch over and lock up the valuables. I like the diamonds best, but there is no necklace among them, and I'm fond of necklaces. They are so becoming. I should choose this one if I might, replied Amy, looking with great admiration at a string of gold and ebony beads, from which hung a heavy cross of the same. I do cover that, but not as the necklace. Ah, no, to me it is a rosary, and as such I should use it like a good Catholic, said Esther, eyeing the handsome thing wistfully. It is meant to use as you used the string of good-smelling wooden beads hanging over your glass? asked Amy. Truly, yes, to pray with. It would be pleasing to the saints if one used so fine a rosary as this, instead of wearing it as a vain bijou. You seem to take a great deal of comfort in your prayers, Esther, and always come down looking quite unsatisfied. I wish I could. If Mademoiselle was a Catholic, she would find true comfort, but as that it is not to be, it would be well if he went apart each day to meditate and pray, as did the good mistress whom I am served before Madame. She had a little chapel, and in it found solace for much trouble. Would it be right for me to do so, too? asked Amy, who, in her loneliness, felt the need of help of some sort and found that she was apt to forget her little book, now that Beth was not there to remind her of it. It would be excellent and charming, and I shall gladly arrange the little dressing-room for you if you like it. Say nothing to Madame, but when she sleeps, go you sit all in alone a while to think good thoughts, and pray the dear God to preserve your sister. Esther was truly pious and quite sincere in her advice. For she had an affectionate heart, and felt much for the sisters in their anxiety. Amy liked the idea, and gave her leave to arrange the light closet next to her room, hoping it would do her good. "'I wish I knew where all these pretty things would go when Aunt March dies,' she said, as she slowly replaced the shining rosary, and shut the jewel cases one by one. "'To you and your sisters, I know it. Madame confides in me.' I witness her will, and it is to be so, whispered Esther, smiling. How nice! But I wish you'd let us have them now. Procrastination is not agreeable, observed Amy, taking a last look at the diamonds. It is too soon yet for the young ladies to wear these things. The first one who is affianced will have the pearls. Madame has said it and I have a fancy that the little turquoise ring will be given to you when you go, for Madame approves your good behavior and charming manners. Do you think so? Oh, I'll be a lamb if I can only have that lovely ring. It's ever so much prettier than Kitty Bryant's. I do like Aunt March, after all. And Amy tried on the blue ring with a delighted face and a firm resolve to earn it. From that day, she was a model of obedience, and the old lady complacently admired the success of her training. 
Esther fitted up the closet with a little table, placed the footstool before it, and over it, a picture taken from one of the shut-up rooms. She thought it was of no great value, but, being appropriate, she borrowed it, well knowing that Madame would never know it, nor care if she did. It was, however, a very valuable copy of one of the famous pictures of the world, and Amy's beauty-loving eyes were never tired of looking up at the sweet face of the Divine Mother, while tender thoughts of her own were busy at her heart. On a table she laid her little testament and hymn book, kept the vase always full of the best flowers Laurie brought her, and came every day to sit alone, thinking good thoughts and praying the dear God to preserve her sister. Esther had given her a rosary of black beads with a silver cross, but Amy hung it up and did not use it, feeling doubtful as to its fitness for Protestant prayers.